In that context, I would like to ask you about uh, what kind of impression Tudman left on you. And Dayton aside, how would you characterize his long-term intentions in the region? Without Tudjman, it would have been very difficult to get an agreement in Dayton. We needed Tudjman, and as I write in the book, Tudjman extracted his own quid pro quo, which was quite reasonable. You expect him to do that. He represented the interests of his nation with skill and tenacity at Dayton. Uh, you mentioned about President Izetbekovic. In your book, you read Izetbekovic, Tudjman, and Milosevic and portray them as uh, neither demons nor angels. According to reviews, the most surprising was your portrayal of Izetbekovic. According to the Richard Bernstein, Izetbekovic comes across as a strangely unsympathetic figure. Is that an accurate interpretation of your intent? This certainly was not my intention. And if that is the impression that somebody gets, like Bernstein, I regret it. Because I should make clear that I have the greatest respect for President Izetbekovic. I wrote in the book repeatedly that if it were not for Alia Izabegovich, Bosnia would not exist today. It was his single-handed tenacity, his courage in staying in Sarajevo when it was under attack, in staying in the presidency building when it was taking direct hits that saved Bosnia. If he had moved to Tuzla, it would have been all over. Sarajevo would have fallen. And Milosevic himself said this, and I have stated in the book that it was his determination even to the root point of, 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 of ruthlessness at times that created his country today. And my respect for him and his courage is unbounded. Now, it's, it's, Bernstein says he's unsympathetic, but nowhere in the book have I said he's unsympathetic. But, a, but he was a man, like other great revolutionaries, who was willing to suffer and to let other people suffer for a political goal. I understand that. It, only because of him does your country exist today. What makes you think uh, that he's like Mao Zedong? You compare him? Because he was better at creating the revolution than at governing the country. He didn't have experience in governing the country. Now, recently, I was in, I was in Sarajevo three weeks ago. And, we had, and President Zabegovic and I had a very good talk. And he took me aside at the end. And he said, I hear you've written a book. And I said, yes. And he said, I don't care what you say about me in it, but just make sure that you tell the truth about who started this war. And I can say to President Izabegovic and to the public that it's very clear in this book that the war was started by the Serb side. At that point, you don't support the theory that Bosnian war was based on historical hatred? Of course not. The, the uh, Sarajevo had been a cosmopolitan city of all ethnic groups and religions for centuries. It had had a terrible period in 1941 to 1945, but all of Europe had been a killing field during that period. It, as recently as 1984, it had had the Winter Olympics, and visitors had marveled at its cosmopolitanness. Of course there were tensions, but there are tensions here in New York City between Puerto Ricans and African Americans and Koreans and Chinese, and, and Italians and, and so on. That goes with the territory. But they had lived together, and their, this ethnic hatreds, ancient ethnic hatreds argument was, was not true. This war was started by opportunistic demagogues, thugs, crooks, who used ultranationalism, which is a code word for racism, to stir up hatreds. And I would say, to the people of Bosnia, all the people, Serbs, Croats, Muslims, that they must live together again as they did in the past. Even though Henry Kissinger was rather for a partition of Bosnia, a lot of people compare you with him, calling you a post-Cold War Kissinger. What do you think you did to deserve that? Comparison? I have no idea. I'm sure Kissinger would be horrified at the comparison. <laughs> Why do you say that? Well, because it, that, that's a joke. Oh, uh, you have met a lot of leaders in your life. Intelligent, intelligence is not needed to be head of state, says Kissinger, talking of him. He singles out courage, being astute, and inner strength. What do you admire the most, and who impresses you the most? Well, I think that uh, to be a successful leader, one has to be intelligent. Maybe you can rise to the top through brutality or cunning. 
or, you know, there are leaders like Idi Amin who just rise to the top by killing people. But strong and great leaders have to have a vision and that they have to have a strategic sense. Who impresses me the most? I think the most impressive single leader I ever met in my life was Deng Xiaoping. Here was a man who single-handedly took a country of one billion people and turned it around. And he was already in his 80s when he did this. It was remarkable. And he had a great vision. He didn't waste time on small talk. He was an extraordinary man. And I think the greatest leader in the world today, living today, is Nelson Mandela in South Africa. I think those are the two gigantic figures. Mandela did what couldn't be done in Bosnia. He avoided an ethnic conflict, a racial war. And today, South Africa has had a peaceful transition to majority rule. Nobody thought that was possible. And that was the mark of Mandela's genius. Ambassador, is it fair to say that if you are waiting for a Bosnian Mandela and Serbian Billy Brown? <laughs> That's a clever question. I hope that the next generation of leaders in the Balkans will set aside these silly, petty, ethnic arguments over history, invented history, exaggerated history, myths, and sometimes reality, and work towards the future. And the model here is Ireland, where after all these centuries, people have begun to work together. Ambassador, you mentioned methods. You mentioned once, I heard, that you didn't shout at uh, Vietnamese or when you were Chinese. Yeah, Chinese at that time. However, everyone agreed that you shouted at Isabekovic and no, threatened him. Never, never all shouted. Along, no, I, say, I in never, sh never shouted at Isabekovic. The only person I ever shouted at was Satcher Bay, and that's because he shouted at me. And we had a kind of a friendly, fraternal relationship, as I write in the book, like like fraternity brothers. He teasing, friendly sometimes very tense, but I like Mohammed Satcher Bey. But I didn't he, get that impression. I, I, I write in the book, we had a fraternal relationship. Fraternal yes, means you... brotherly. But I also say that he aggravated a lot of people because he was in love with television cameras at times. And he likes to go out and say things which are provocative. I'm sure after this interview, he's going to go out and say something very provocative. But I like Satcher Bay, and, and he, it is Satcher Bay who brought me into the Bosnian business to begin with, as I recount in the book. Yeah, you saw him on TV. But, sir, yeah. they accuse you that you like media, too. Is that... I don't, uh, I don't love the media, but you have to work with the media in the modern world to get the message across and achieve a negotiation. I didn't ask for this interview today. You did. I have not called any media to ask to be on television. I respond to their requests. And then I, afterwards, the reporters come to me and ask me to be available, and then they accuse me of seeking the publicity. That's, that's a double standard. You know that in Vera. I was very difficult, wasn't I? It was uh, hard, hard for you to get here today. To be, to be honest, sir, this is a, probably my fifth interview with you. But today, what was, let's say, most important and most difficult. Yeah, see, uh, that was, means you're making money now, sir. Is it hard to... No, it's just that I'm busy and the media, the media is not my main concern. Is it fair to say that you are a fireman uh, on waiting? <laughs> Let's say you are an advisor, but the White House is not paying. Well, I don't need any money from the White House. 